Welcome back everyone. I've been working to improve the curb appeal of my home and in today's video I'll show you how I installed this brand new door. As for my old door, it has this big metal screen door on the outside and this interior door as the main door. So I'll show you how to go from this to this. And the change feels most dramatic from the outside. I've done two other videos about improving my home's curb appeal, the porch ceiling and the stone veneer, but changing the door has definitely been the most impactful. It was also a ton of work, and so in this video, I wanna try and give you an idea of all the bits and pieces that go into replacing a front door. So here's the new Craftsman style door I bought from Home Depot for about 475 bucks. As you can see, it's fiberglass. And there's a little plug here so that the door doesn't swing open. The first thing I wanna do with it is paint it. So I'm gonna take the pins out of the hinges. <laughs> this stuff is really sticky. And bring the door down to the basement where I can paint it horizontally. So I wanna clean up all these little smudges that I made. And also this seems to have a bit of white dust all over it, so I want to give it a good wipe down before we start painting. I'm going to use a little bit of this to try and clean up some of the smudges. That worked perfectly. And I'm using this semi-gloss urethane alkyd enamel, and I knew I wanted a dark color for the outside of the door, and so I went with Bear's Color of the Year, which was Cracked Pepper. So I taped up the windows, but I wouldn't recommend cutting on the glass like I did because I can see those lines. Next, I used a small synthetic fiber brush to do all the detail work and a bigger one to do the larger areas. I also used the small brush to do the edges, and I found I could avoid using tape if I push the brush down pretty hard to create this curve, and I would get a nice straight line. This is the finish after one coat and one day. I wanted to recoat it yesterday, but it still was a little bit damp in spots, probably because my basement is a bit cold and it took longer to dry. There are a couple little spots like this that I'm going to sand down before I do the next coat. Long story short here, I sanded and painted this two more times, and in the end, I wasn't really happy with the finish. So despite all that sanding and the supposedly high flow rate of the paint, it is still very streaky. And then some parts is just downright rough. Dissatisfied with that finish, I decided to sand it all smooth. And if you do this, be careful about the paint debris that's kind of like pencil eraser remnants, because I think it sometimes created spots like this if I went over them again. So keep wiping or vacuuming that away. I think those spots also happened if I sanded in one spot for too long. And this plastic part here is always taking the paint a lot better than the fiberglass. With the door sanded smooth, I bought an HVLP or high volume, low pressure paint sprayer to try and get a better finish on the door. I don't think I ever got this to work quite properly because I can never get a good solid stream of paint coming out no matter how I adjusted it. And that's maybe because my air hose was too small a diameter or maybe my air compressor had too small of a tank. Either way, I still used it to paint the door and just went very slowly. And the door ended up with kind of a rough, interesting texture that I actually don't mind. So I was looking all over for the instructions and the long screws that go through the hinges and into the framing. And I looked underneath and I couldn't find it anywhere. And so if you're having a similar problem, look up here. I found it stapled up here. And it has a whole list of tools that you need. This also does say you should install a sill pan before installing the door unit. And of course this doesn't come with it, so we'll go get that at the store. One thing that you want to make sure of is that the hole without a screw is closest to this weather stripping because you want it to go into the stud. If it gets much further out, you might miss the stud in the wall. So if for some reason your door came with screws in these two and was missing one here, take one of these out and put it in the missing one there. So a little bit of terminology. This side is called the hinge jam because it has the hinges on it. This side is called the latch jam because it has the latch and the deadbolt holes for it. This up top is called the head jam and this below is called the door sill. So those are your four sides of your door frame. 
So on the outside is the brick mold. And so this is the latch brick mold because it's on this side. And this would be the hinge brick mold. But for my installation, I'm actually gonna remove this because my walls are so thick that this door jam isn't thick enough. And to order one that would have fit would have cost a lot of money. So I need to take this off and then put other pieces of wood so that I can get flush with the siding of my house. Here you can see the new door jam it goes about two and a half inches out from the face of the door. And on my existing door, you can see it's closer to five inches. So yeah, this door is 33 and 5 eighths across. And this one is just 31 and 7 eighths. But that's the closest I could get without going custom. The next size door is 36 inches. And this is 79 and 3 eighths inches tall, whereas my current door is about 83 inches tall. And I'm glad I'm taking this off anyway, because look how poorly that's aligned. And then over here, it's not great either, and it's a little bit messed up. Much cleaner. I'm going to do most of the work of replacing the door tomorrow, but today I'm going to get a head start by taking out the molding. First step, I'm going to use this blade to cut along the corner here through all the paint. Then I use a scraper and a hammer to create a gap, and then a small pry bar to really separate it from the wall. That wasn't too bad. And the screen door has these one-way security screws, so we'll just have to reach in there with the grinder and cut them out. That looks so different already. Now I'm gonna remove the pins from the door hinges. Yeah, this is so light. Definitely hollow. Ah, oh, why do they make flathead screws? Now let's get rid of the old brick molding. So this isn't what I was expecting. I thought we'd be able to see through to where the door jam was attached, but it looks like it's just very all built in. I think I'm just gonna have to end up using this wood here as the studs, which I think will be fine. And just getting rid of the weather stripping and other door hardware. Now I'm gonna try and take this threshold out. There we go. There are the big screws. So I ended up having to break this apart completely because it's held in with some really big nails from the side and also went underneath some of the other wood. All right, here it is all cleaned up. You can see the old subfloor. Of course, I mean, I need to cut this out now because it doesn't fit within there. So this is as far as it's going in because this whole piece of wood is blocking it. Same over there. So I found that if you start with the sawzall shallow enough, you can actually work it in so that you can cut right through. That was a bit uneven, so I smoothed it out with the block plane. Is it normal to have such a big step up on the door? So the decision now is whether to have this threshold down so there's not such a transition between the wood floor and the threshold. But that would necessitate cutting this wood floor back, which isn't such a big deal, I don't think. And then the other option is to just have it on top of the wood floor like that, still flush with the inside. But then it's at least an inch step here. And I think I'm really favoring the option to cut the wood. What do you think, Mom? I think we should do the lower option. So we're gonna cut along this, using that piece of wood as a guide, and this oscillating saw, and hopefully get a nice straight cut to butt up the threshold. We're thinking this looks a lot better. This way it's not such a big step over the threshold. Before it would have been this high up. 
So my mom just noticed that the jam isn't flush with the threshold on this side, but it is on this side. So another example of the great quality control of this door company. So that was an easy fix at least, and now it's flush. And this gap will definitely need the two x four up there. So to deal with the threshold of the new door, not sitting on the concrete well, I got these three different thresholds, hoping that one of them will work out. My leading contender is this one right here because it is three quarters of an inch tall. Basically it'd be something like this, just one threshold sitting on top of the other to make up for the difference in height. So from up here, it looks pretty good, but this isn't sitting down where it should be. And so this part is too thick in the back. All right, it's a little unconventional, but I think it'll work. Cascading thresholds. I also could not get this door and window sill pan flashing to fit here. It just didn't go in well. The little tabs of the sill pan were hitting against this. I just would have had to modify it completely. And then the back of it would have been against this wood and would have interfered with it, how it met up with the threshold of the door. So instead of the sill pan, we're gonna use this Pella Smart Flash, which is just a tape. And we'll put it along in here to help make that a little bit more weather resistant. Here I got a bit ahead of myself because you actually want to put this tape in from the bottom up, which is why I'm folding this side of the tape back up. So I should have started near the porch and worked towards the inside. That's looking a lot better. I'm using this tape to mark exactly where this threshold goes and also to avoid any of the sealant coming onto the concrete. The instructions say to put a few half inch beads of the sealant underneath the threshold. And of course, this is the second threshold. So you'll see it will also put it on the threshold that came with the door. The one tube of sealant ran out, so I had to switch to another, which as you can see, is a different color. But that won't matter because it's going to be underneath. Okay, we really want to, can you start lifting? Yeah. Oh, okay, wait. Fingers? Yeah, just keep bringing it up. Let's see. Yeah, perfect. We're now past the point of no return. Like the door's in. Here's our double threshold. Thanks, mom. In the instructions, the door is already on before putting it in position, but we had left it off so that the frame was easier to move around. The instructions say to start with a shim on both sides up at the top and on both sides at the level of the bottom hinge. Then check the hinge jam is plumb both in and out and left to right. Adjust the shims and or lean of the door if you need to. Next, remove the weather stripping by pulling it out from one end. Now on both the hinge jam and the latch jam, drill a 3 16 inch hole 8 inches up from the threshold and a quarter inch in from the jam stop. Do this again, but 8 inches down from the head jam. Next, drive a number 10 by a three inch screw into each hole, leaving the head sticking out about a quarter inch so you can still make adjustments with shims. So. Recheck the hinge jam to make sure it's still plumb. All right, so here we can see with that bubble there that the bottom of the jam needs to come out of it. If you hold it like that, we can see we need to shim the bottom a bit so that the side comes out. Yeah, that looks really good. That looks perfect. Drive the hinge jam screws 1 16th inch below the surface. The next step is to shim behind the middle hinge. Make that nice and firm. And then to put the long screws through each of the hinges. These are the screws that came with the door. And those are the shims falling out. Two long screws go through the top hinge, so I need to take out one of the shorter ones. And again, you always want to make sure it's the hole closest to the jam stop. This piece here is called the jam stop. Now that we have the hinge jam all set, we're trying to get the latch jam all secured and also make sure it's even around the head jam as well. So we'll put shims in to try and make this an even reveal. See where you can see the light coming through the door? We want that to be an even reveal all the way around. So that looks way too tight up here. 
think this needs a little bit of shimming there. Open and close the door to make sure it's not rubbing anywhere. Then once you're happy with the latch jam, drive those two screws in. To test the fit between the threshold and the door sweep, which is that rubber along the bottom, put a piece of paper over the threshold where a screw is, close the door, and pull the paper out. If it pulls out with some slight tension and without tearing, the clearance is good. If the paper tears or is too loose, you can adjust the threshold with all of these screws. You can fill those screw holes with wood putty, but I'm trying to close this up for the night and I'm reinstalling the weather stripping. These are corner seal pads, which are wedge shaped, and the thick end goes under the weather stripping like this. Peel off the backing and stick one on each side. Cut off the excess length of the shims and then admire your partially installed door. This is the downtown model deadbolt I bought from Quickset. This is our latch bolt, and the first step is to extend it using a screwdriver. So here we want to see that this D-shaped hole is centered in the hole of the door. And it is. If it's not, then you'd rotate this outer casing to make this piece longer. Now you can see in this case it's too far to the left, so we actually want this shorter. And that's perfect. Because this door has a rectangular recess to hold the faceplate, we now need to install this back plate onto the latch bolt. And it just slides over the bolt and clicks into place over this little circular nub. And this curved part here lets us know that this is the bottom of the latch bolt. So this slides in with that curved side down and probably needs a good push to set it in place. And we take two of these small screws to fully attach that faceplate and the latch bolt behind it. So this kit comes with two sets of bolts depending on how thick your door is. So just measure it and figure out if you're gonna use the long or the short ones. This door is one and three quarters, which means I'll use the slightly longer ones. So now make sure the turn piece is vertical and this mounting plate goes over the back of it like this. So now we want this, the torque blade, to go right through the latch cam. Make sure the turn piece is vertical and that the deadbolt is extended. So you can see it coming through that hole right there. And that lower hole is where we want this shaft or torque blade to go. So make sure the curved part of that shaft is pointing up when you insert it. And it settles into place like that. And you'll want to hold on to it until you put the screws in. Now grab those screws that you measured the door for and screw them in. As you tighten these up, make sure that your hardware is level and plumb. Now you can check to see that the deadbolt operates smoothly, both with the turn piece and with the key. Finally, we have to install the strike plate. And in my case, my door frame came with a hole that was a bit too small for this strike plate. So here I'm using a razor to trace out the perimeter of the strike plate. So I can then chisel out this recess to the right dimensions. This was still a snug fit. So I used a piece of wood to protect the door frame as I hammered it into position. Now drive the two longest screws into the holes closest to the jam stop or weather stripping and the shorter screws in the last two holes. And that's the deadbolt installed. This is the quick set handle set I got. And it goes on the door like this, which requires a hole to be drilled through this new door. And thanks to this clever little piece, there's quite a bit of tolerance in where that hole goes. The first step is to take this template and fold it down the dotted line. On the template, you can see the deadbolt hole, and this is where the handle set is gonna go. And for this handle, it tells us to drill the lower mounting hole in one of these two locations, depending on how it lines up with the hole in the door above. Now line up the fold on the template along the edge of the door and feel for the hole through the template and move it around as necessary and figure out if it's the left circle or the right circle that it's lining up with. In my case, it lines up with the right circle, so I'll follow that right vertical line down to the dot at nine and one eighth inch, which is the distance for this handle. And then I use an awl to make a mark on the door where we need to drill that hole. Now I'm using a smaller drill bit to do a pilot hole through the door as straight and level as I can. The instructions say to use a 7 16 inch drill bit, which seems really big considering this is a piece that needs to go through it. So I'm going to be a bit cautious here and use a smaller drill bit instead. 
Now hold the bottom latch up against the door to see if this D-shaped hole is in the center of the hole in the door, which it is. If it weren't, there's a little adjustment here we can make with this pin to make it longer. And so now that D-shaped hole isn't centered. So with this little pin that goes out on both sides, we can slide it in and make this shorter again. And this is the right length for my door. The beveled part of the latch goes towards where the door closes, and this slides in just like that. And now we secure it with these two small screws. This part here is called the spindle, and it goes into that D-shaped hole. But as you can see right now, it actually wouldn't line up. And these clever lock designers made it so you can pull the spindle out and rotate it around. And this is so the handle will work with the left hand or right hand opening door. And now it will fit with this one. Now put that bottom post through the hole you made in the door and the spindle through the bottom latch. And you can see how the spindle has come through. Now we'll secure the bottom of the handle with this plastic washer and long screw. And don't make it too tight yet because we want to make sure that the handle is nice and parallel with the edge of the door. And that's already looking really good. Now we'll put this beautiful handle in. It slides on just like that and you can start securing it with one of the screws. To better reach the other screw, using the supplied Allen wrench, loosen the grub screw in the handle and remove the handle. Now you can easily tighten both screws while making sure that that face plate is all nice and straight. Check to make sure that your handle is vertical again, and if you're happy with it, tighten up those three screws. This little screw cover has a notch in it, so I'm gonna make sure that's facing down so you can't see it. And it just snaps right on. Now we can reinstall the handle and tighten up that grub screw. Finally, we can install the strike plate in the door frame by securing it with the two supplied screws. And that's the new handle and deadbolt installed. Wow, that looks like a real door. And it doesn't even have all the molding around it yet. Oh, it looks like a real door out here too. It looks so great. And I don't think this double threshold worked out too badly. Wow, it's been a long day. It's been about 10 hours working on this door, and I don't even have any of the molding back on. I only have it closing and locking now. Huge thanks to my mom for coming to help, because I could not have done this without her. So my mics ran out of batteries, and I'm about to run out of batteries myself. So, to be continued tomorrow. <laughs> what a mess. All right, it's the next day, and I'm ready to tackle all the molding. Now I just need to scrape all the old caulk and paint off of the back of these boards. And of course, remove the nails, which unfortunately leaves holes like this. I guess one option actually is you could just snip it off flush there and not pound it out and then get the damage on the outside. And it's as good as not having it there. So these are obviously too tall now. So this is as much overlap as I can get because of the hinges. And if I'm happy with that, then this is the same reveal that I want to have along this top bit here. Once I have this line marked, I can mark the new height of the trim on each side and use the speed square to bring it across. So I'm supporting this here on a sawhorse because I really want to make sure I get a straight cut. Okay, like that is straight up and down. And of course, because the door is narrower now, I have that little gap and this little gap to fill in, not to mention this top part. So now this headpiece is gonna be too wide, so I'm gonna have to take it all apart, cut the pieces down and put it back together. So I'm lining up this side as it was before, and then I'll mark this side where I need to cut it shorter. All right, I have all my cuts marked out. So now I need to make this straight cut end look like this end. First, I'm gonna use this rasp, which is a very coarse file and it'll remove a lot of material quickly. All right, that'll do. Now I'm gonna try and get this to fit back on here. 
which means I'm gonna shorten this end because this one's in better shape. And I just need to get this piece back out. There we go. And I was using the rail of this to help line up this on here so that it's nice and flat. So when I put that top piece on there, it all matches up nicely. Just super gluing this end on. Let's put some longer ones through here. The resize header. All right, that looks great. Before I put up that top piece, I'm gonna put some insulation that I had left over from my attic. And this is rock wool insulation, so it's not annoying to touch like fiberglass. I'm trying to smooth out this transition between where the paint was and where the molding used to be. Yes! The next step is to fill these gaps here with expanding foam. Shake vigorously for a minute and screw on the straw. And it says not to fill any cracks more than 50% and go slow. You can see how that kept expanding out and we'll just cut that away with a razor blade when we're done. I also put some here because I didn't want this filling out with dirt and being a good hiding spot for the little creatures. Here I put so much foam that it came out on the inside. Luckily this cleaned up pretty easily by scraping it off and cleaning off the residue with acetone, which still works while it's wet. I've had lunch and this is hardened up and so now I'm gonna try and cut this extra stuff out. I need to start filling in gaps like this. So I've cut a piece of wood on the table saw. Then I also need to fill in gaps like this so I can start putting in the trim. And I have some three quarter inch wood like this that is gonna go along the sides here, all the way flush to the sheathing. And I think I wanna make it so that it is even with that line there. So I'll have to have little pieces in between. And for these pieces closer to the ground, I primed the bottom section to make sure they'd be more water resistant. Here's a spacer board, which should make the trim line up with that reveal line around the door frame. All right, first piece of finishing trim, exciting. I had to put some spacers behind the vertical trim. All right, using these shims, I was able to keep it right along this line. And repeat for the other side. And here you can see how the shim really pushes that molding out to meet the line. Some of the molding overlaps that second threshold, so I have to cut out little notches to accommodate. And again, because it's so low, I'm priming it to make sure it's more water resistant. I use some trim caulking to help fill in some of the gaps and holes in all this woodwork. And before I can get the trim in on the right side, I need to move the doorbell out of the way. And this required cutting a channel for the cord. Now I'm making sure the molding is plumb while creating a quarter inch reveal and securing it with the nails. I want the top of the molding to be just like it is on the inside. So now I need to cut all the wood down to create that part of it. This brad nailer makes quick work of the assembly. And then I'm priming it before I put it up. And you may notice I'm missing that cove molding, but I haven't been able to find it in the same size yet. And a quick coat of primer on the exposed wood. And quickly swapping out the doorbell for a newer model. Quite a difference. And wow, this result makes all this hard work so worthwhile. I'm so happy with how this is coming out. But I still have all the final details to finish up. That includes using joint compound to smooth the transition between the paint and where the molding now is. And of course, gave it a light sanding to make it even smoother. Driving the nails further into the wood so they can be hidden. On the inside, I used joint compound to fill in some of the nail holes. It was really easy to sand off and it seems to have worked really well. Outside and in some other locations, I used Bondo to fill the holes. And I'm sure that's much more durable and is also a lot harder to sand. 
I used it for covering those screw holes and realized I could use tape to mask off the area a little bit. That helped. Finally, I used it to deal with these nails that were sticking through the door frame from when it was made in the factory. So I pulled them down, snipped them off, and then covered them up with Bondo. Finally, it was time to put caulking along every single joint to fill in any gaps and make this molding look seamless. I had some soapy water so I could wet my gloved finger and run it down the bead of caulking and get it nice and smooth. Here's an example of before and after caulking. And of course, I did it on all the outside molding as well. And finally, after all these little details, it was time for paint. And it took me two coats of the Alcad paint to finish this up. Fortunately, I still had some of my interior paint to fill in all around the door. And there it is all finished. And just a quick reminder of where we started and where we ended up. So overall, this project ended up costing just over $1,000. It was $475 just for the door, another $175 for the paint and the brushes and the spray gun, about $55 for all the sealant materials like the Pella tape and the caulking, about $150 for all the molding and woodwork needed on the exterior, and $160 for the deadbolt and the handle set. So if you're looking to tackle a project like this, I hope this video has been helpful, and see you next time. Hey, I'm Dan, and my mom and I bought some land out in the countryside to build a house. And to help with that, we thought we should have a trailer. So why not renovate a 1949 Spartan Manor? So if you want to see how these go, plus some other random DIY stuff, subscribe and follow along.